Today is my pleasure to introduce the presenter, Dr. Juan Sebastian Lopez, who is the research scientist managing the X-ray analysis facilities here at the MRL. Juan is actually has joined us after completing his PhD at the University of Michigan in material science and engineering at the end of 2019. So while at Michigan, he was an NSF fellow and a Rackham Merit fellow and also a graduate advisor to the College of Engineering. Juan Lopez started his scientific engineering journey at the University of Florida, where he's, he received his BS in chemical engineering while minoring in material science and engineering. Uh, Juan has a deep passion for correlated materials in crystallography, which is ultimately drew him to material science. In addition to managing the X-ray lab at MRL, he also managed our magnetometry systems, PPMS and MPMS tools, also here in the in the in the lab. So, as I said, today he will be presenting an introduction to uh, small angle X-ray scattering and applicability to different materials. So, Juan, thank you very much for putting together this presentation for us, taking the time to to give this talk. Uh, with that. Uh, I would like to welcome you here to this webinar series. Thank you very much, Mauro, for that very kind introduction. And uh, thank you all for attending the talk today. Um, so like Mauro mentioned, I am Juan Sebastian Lopez, and I'll just be giving you a short introduction to small angle X-ray scattering, otherwise known as SACS. So I'm a research scientist here, and uh, without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Okay. So uh, first I have an outline for you. I'm going to start with the basics and the fundamentals of SACS. And then from there, we're going to build up into uh, some data manipulation and different, different transformations on your data uh, that you can then use to extract some useful information about the materials that you're trying to analyze. And then I'll talk about some real world examples. And then uh, I'll wrap it up with a summary. So uh, first and foremost, as with any researcher, you might be wondering why somebody would want to do small angle X-ray scattering. Um, well, there are some pretty solid reasons why. And uh, the first reason is that one, uh, this technique can help you understand the size of various different particles or different features um, of your sample. Uh, say you have like a nanoparticle in solution, uh, you can then use SACS to understand the average part, the global average particle size for that sample. Um, and it's not just limited to spherical particles or like any one particular sample in general. Uh, if it can scatter x-rays, if your sample can scatter, it can be characterized using SACS. So another cool thing that you can do is analyze average particle shapes. Um, Again, because it's a global average, you'll be getting the average particle shape, but that can be useful for characterizing your sample. Uh, taking this a step further, you can look at monodisperse and polydisperse samples as well. If your mixture contains particulates that may have different radii or have different types of shapes, SACS will be able to determine the average size or average shape uh, of your entire ensemble since it's a global averaging technique. One other cool thing that you can do is that it can help you determine the morphology of various systems. Uh, if it can scatter, we can detect it. So here we have an example of like a patchy particle which has ligands attached to a core. And then using SACS, you can scatter off the ligands and the core and then reconstruct that data back, or, or sorry, uh, fit that data in order to get the, uh, the average size of these ligands and the core shell and uh, possibly how they're interacting with each other. Uh, and SACS isn't just limited to these, different, um, to these different applications of the technique. There are a number of different things, but these are the most common. There are a, you can determine a number of different things like the internal structure, like I mentioned before. You can determine porosity. Um, you can also determine uh, average pore size, if that's something that you want to look at. Uh, you can also determine orientation of your sample as well as uh, crystallinity, if that's something that you're interested in looking at. Uh, so now you might be wondering how SACS is set up in order to achieve all of this. So let's talk a little bit about experimental setup. 
So it all starts with an X-ray source, usually copper because it's a shorter wavelength, but molybdenum sources have also been used. It'll all depend on what you want out of your system, but here at the MRL, we use a copper source. Uh, so once we have those X-rays generated, uh, you're going to want to get rid of any divergent beams by collimating them. Uh, this will help make sure your beam is uh, more uniform and make the experiment a bit more accurate. Uh, from there, those x-rays are going to exit the collimator and irradiate your sample. There, a variety of different um, x-ray matter interactions can occur, but in SACS, as the name suggests, uh, we'll be looking at the x-rays that bounce or essentially scatter off of your samples. And uh, these x-rays are going to be scattering at different angles. And these angles are going to be indicative of the morphology and the general structure of your sample. Now, as they make their way over to the detector, they're gonna be passing by a beam stop. And the beam stop is gonna be very important. One, because it serves two major functions. The first is that it's going to block out the direct beam. That's, uh, it's going to block out the direct beam, uh, which is gonna be important because uh, if you don't block out the direct beam, it's going to be much harder to analyze or to detect the scattered X-rays that you want to actually look for. And second, it's also going to detect, or sorry, uh, it's going to protect your detector from the direct beam so that it doesn't get oversaturated. Uh, and this is just going to help with, uh, well, one, getting your measurement, and two, prolonging the life of the instrument. So the beam stop is actually very important in the operation. And then lastly, those scattered X-rays are going to make their way over to the detector where we detect them. And uh, that's essentially the, the experimental setup in a nutshell. Um, this is the optic path, and that's usually how it runs. But now let's look at the scattering side of things. So on the right side, uh, you can, like I mentioned before, you have your incident x-rays coming in. They're going to be scattering off of your sample with a variety of different characteristic length scales. And so most of the time, a lot of people run the SACS because it usually detects the what they want, but then by bringing the detector in a little closer, you can actually detect some wider angle, some x-rays that are scattered at wider angles, and then that's also just going to be uh, give you complementary information. Uh, the reason why you might want to do this is because they can resolve different things. Uh, you might be wondering what sorts of features SACS and WAX can actually observe. So in a nutshell, SACS will give you nanoscale resolution, which is going to be very important for nanoscale materials. And then WAX is going to complement that with some atomic resolution information. And that's going to be very powerful as well. So generally, if, if you're going to do WAX, you're going to be looking at structures that, he, that are on the order between 100 and about 1 nanometer. And then WAX can go even lower than that, down to about 0 0.1 nanometers. Uh, they have a variety of different two theta and a Q, or what we call a scattering vector, which is going to be an in inverse nanometers that correlate with that. But essentially, in a nutshell, it's going to be the, the size of the things that you're looking for. So that will help you determine whether or not you want to run SACS or WAX. So having this information now, we can uh, look at a variety of different things uh, to characterize a variety of different samples. Uh, one can even begin to look at DNA, for example. Uh, understanding DNA structure is incredibly, incredibly biologically relevant, and so it finds a lot of use and applicability in the biological sciences. Uh, another biological example is going to be like viruses, for example. Understanding their capsids and the coat proteins is going to be important for its biological activity. Uh, yet another biological example is going to be uh, much bigger ensembles, things like a uh, huge proteins, right? Uh, basically, you can use sex to understand their complex coiled structures. And then one that's going to be more relevant for our material scientists and polymer scientists out there is uh, if you're interested in particles or self-assembled structures, you can use sex to probe a variety of different length scales uh, in your sample. Um, right, so we've talked about uh, what you can characterize using SACS, and we've also covered how SACS is more or less set up experimentally, but we haven't actually talked about how it works. And so uh, there are a variety of different things that can happen when x-rays interact with matter. Uh, 
But the one mechanism that we're going to be looking at is going to be elastic scattering. And elastic scattering is going to be very, very useful because, it, well, the way it works is you have an X-ray coming in with a certain energy and a certain wavelength, which we call lambda one. And it's essentially just going to bounce off of an electron uh, with the same energy and the same wavelength, but just at a very different angle. And so um, that's going to be the most relevant mechanism for this experiment. You're going to be basically looking at the x-rays that bounce off of all of these different electrons in your materials. Now, knowing that electrons act as the source of the scattering, or since the electrons are the scattering centers, it makes sense that increasing the number of electrons would then increase the scattering, maximizing your signal. So as a rule of thumb, generally samples comprised of heavier elements tend to have brighter intensities, but that isn't always the case. Just a general rule of thumb to go by. So another important thing to cover is to understand how SACs can actually resolve different features, uh, basically contrast. Uh, contrast is going to be very important because it's ultimately going to be uh, the means by which you can actually see the, the particles or the systems that you want to look at. So generally, contrast works on the basis of differences in electron density. And so here I have two examples. On the left is a sample of nanoparticles that are suspended in a matrix that has a very different electron density to um, to that of the nanoparticles. And so the electron density is going to be very different, right? That delta is going to be appreciable. And so then you, you will get some scattering from your matrix and then some scattering from your particles, and then you'll be able to detect both. And that's going to be pretty great. Uh, an example, the example on the right is a sample where the nanoparticles actually have a similar electron density to that of the matrix. And so you can see that it might be a bit more difficult to view those structures. So generally you want to avoid matrices or matrices that are similar in composition to your system. Uh, like for example, if you're observing silica nanoparticles that are suspended in a silicone gel, that's going to be pretty tough to resolve. <laughs> um, so now that we, now that we've covered scattering and how uh, electrons are the centers of scattering or the scattering centers and how that can affect contrast, I want to go over how scattering can actually end up giving you the structural information that we're looking for. So here in the center of the screen, I have a single electron and I'm going to have an X-ray come in and irradiate that electron. And so that X-ray is going to bounce off, but that bounced off uh, X-ray I'm going to represent as a wave. And as that wave basically emanates, uh, it's going to have the same energy and again, the same wavelength as the incoming X-ray It's just going to emanate in a variety of different directions. Um, and this is essentially the basis uh, of SACs. Now, if I add two electrons, it gets more interesting because now though those uh, emanating X-rays can now interfere with each other. And they can interfere in a variety of different ways, but uh, we can, or sorry, they, they'll interfere in two different ways. The first way is going to be the destructive interference, which I've uh, basically uh, the destructive interference are essentially areas where the amplitudes are going to cancel each other out. And so those are going to be much less bright, a barely detectable x-rays that are, if they end up making it to the source. Uh, the other type of interference is going to be constructive, which are going to be outlined in these orange, uh, orange boxes over here. And so because they interfere constructively, these are the x-rays that can actually ultimately make it to the detector and be um, uh, be, be seen and be characterized. So basically, if you have a much larger ensemble, uh, all these you're going to you're going to be getting a lot more interference, uh, which is then going to be a function of where these electrons are relative to each other, and then ultimately all these constructed all these constructive interfering waves are eventually going to make it to the detector, and then that's what's finally going to relay that structural information. So all those waves are finally detected. And once you detect those waves, you actually end up, you end up with a two-dimensional scattering pattern that looks like this. Uh, in the center here, we have our beam stop. 
And then this, these are just like some scattered waves that have very, very small angles. And then ultimately you're going to get a peak with a peak like this, which is going to be uh, isotropic. And uh, that is going to be indicative of your structure. So this particular two-dimensional isotropic scattering pattern is actually a silver behenate. It's a standard that we use in the scattering world. So uh, let me take another scattering pattern as an example. So here we have another scattering pattern and you see a, a bunch of different concentric circles. And uh, if you take this data from your sample and then you integrate it along some azimuth, you're essentially going to be getting some two-dimensional scattering, or sorry, a scattering, uh, a scattering curve, which you can then use to fit. Um, before I move on, I would like to point out that you can already begin to infer some, some very important information about your sample just from this two-dimensional scattering pattern alone. So uh, you can see here, like in the example from before and the example above, when you have like powder suspensions that generally are more randomly oriented, uh, they're going to have these more isotropic scattering patterns. However, as you start looking at more oriented systems, uh, say like you have something like a fiber or a sheared liquid, uh, that isotropic pattern is going to become anisotropic. And again, that's going to be um, correlated to the degree of orientation of your sample. Going even further, say we, we look at something like a single crystal, it's going to become even more is anisotropic, giving you discrete points on the detector. And so you're essentially going to be getting diffraction-like scattering. Okay, so now uh, let's go back to the scattering curve from before. Uh, the scattering curve is gonna have a variety of different sections that are going to be relevant for your analysis. So like the sorts of things that we can extract, the sorts of things that we can detect out of your data are going to come from different sections of your scattering curve. So if we have, for example, um, like in, in this very first section, you'll be able to determine things like the size of your particle using a Guigné plot. Uh, some other things that you can do is uh, try and extract the shape of your particle using a, a transform. And then lastly, you'll be able to infer some more surface information from the latter, latter section of the plot. Uh, this is a schematic just to kind of give you an idea uh, of where these different sections lie, but it will vary depending on, on the sample. Uh, these are the three most commonly recognized regions of the sex data, and uh, they are going to be the most characteristic for that particular um, property that you're looking for. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Guigné plot first. Uh, the Guigné plot is essentially just like a, a way to manipulate your data. So if we have this scattering curve, like I showed you before, which is an integration from a two-dimensional scattering pattern, it's essentially just gonna be a function of intensity as a function of the scattering vector, which is gonna be in inverse nanometers. So if you take this data and you take the natural log of your intensity, and then you plot that against the square of your scattering vector, uh, in a lot of spherical examples, in a lot of globular cases, it's going to give you a straight line. And then this straight line, you can then fit using this equation below, where you have the natural log of I naught, and then that slope, you can actually fit with this uh, RG squared over three. And then this RG is actually something that's called the radius of gyration. I'm gonna get into that in a little bit, but uh, before, before I go to the radius of gyration, I just wanna point out that these straight lines are going to be very, very characteristic of globular samples or more spherical samples. And so while you can extract the radius of gyration, uh, it's already going to give you some, a bit of qualitative information about the, the shape of your sample. Uh, generally, spherical particles tend to have straighter lines, whereas, uh, say, like oblong samples tend to deviate from the linearity. So let's, uh, let's go back to the radius of gyration real quick. What is the radius of gyration? So as, as a formalism, the radius of gyration is an average electron density, is the average electron density weighted by the squared distance of the scatterers from the center of the object. And basically what that means is you're essentially just like looking at all of these different scattering centers and then you're taking their weighted average to the center. 
And so the radius of gyration is essentially going to be an approximation of uh, your particle size, which is going to be very, very useful. Uh, so uh, the radius of gyration, uh, at least its formalism is generally this integral, like I, men like I mentioned before, of that electron density function as a function of distance. So um, that's radius of gyration, that's a Guignet plot. Another plot that you can look at is the Kratky plot. Uh, the Kratky plot is essentially, it's a bit more sensitive to the morphology of a particle. And if you're looking at uh, more biological samples, it's gonna be sensitive to the compactness of a protein. And then you'll also be able to look at different unfolded and folded states of proteins and different and other biological materials as well. The way you would get a Kratky plot is essentially you take that same scattering curve, uh, but then you just multiply that intensity by the square of the scattering vector Q, and then just plot that as a function of Q. And then that's going to be giving you the Kratky plot. Uh, now this isn't the most helpful, but the Kratky plot is going to be very characteristic of different shapes and different folding states. And so that's what I'm showing here. So on the left, I have a plot of uh, three different the three different particle suspensions. One is gonna be polydispersed, one is gonna be needle-like, and another is going to be plate-like. And you can see from the Kratky plot that they're all going to have very different characteristic curves. And so this is gonna be another useful tool that you can use to determine your particle shape. Now, extending this to some biological materials, you can detect things like protein folding, or if you're looking at different uh, polymer chains, uh, reptation is something else that you can look into. Uh, in blue here, I have a, a globular protein, which is going to be just like a, a pretty standard bell curve. But then as you unfold that protein here in black, this black curve right here, that, that curve is going to change drastically. And it's going to go from, uh, from a bell curve looking thing, and it's just going to increase uh, with increasing scattering, or sorry, with increasing Q, which is the scattering vector. As you change the folding states of that protein, you're going to get different artifacts, different artifact peaks, which are going to, to again, be characteristic of the state of that protein. Uh, if you have like a multi-domain protein here in red, it's gonna have two peaks. If you have a multi-domain protein with a flexible linker, that linker is going to, uh, to increase the intensity because of that added um, scattering. And so you can see that you can already begin to characterize different folding states uh, using the Kratky plot. Uh, this is a, more of a qualitative technique, but if you, pr if you create different uh, models, you can get more quantitative analysis out of it. Um, now, another, another thing that you can do uh, is what's called the pair distance distribution function. And basically what this is, is uh, it's just another transformation on your data. Uh, you basically take that intensity and you take this integral of that intensity uh, according to the equation on the bottom, um, and that's going to take your scattering curve and it's going to sp spit, out, uh, spit out a histogram. And this histogram as a function uh, is essentially a function of your intensity or the intensity is a function of the distances within that particle. And so this is a histogram of all of the different pairs of points within a particle. So all of the different interparticle distances. And so this is going to give you quantitative information on particle size as well as particle shape. Uh, I can give you a quick example here where we have the scattering curve for a spherical particle. If we then do that pair distance distribution function transform, uh, we get this bell shaped curve uh, for the spherical particle. Uh, if we look at a cylindrical particle, that, that pair distance distribution function tends to deviate a little more. Uh, because that cylindrical particle is less symmetric than the spherical particle. Um, so in this case, for example, the cylindrical particle is going to be a little over 30 nanometers, and then you can use a model to, to fit this data to get even more quantitative information about the, morpho about the structure of the particle. Uh, taking this a step further, uh, looking at different intensities and pair distance distribution functions for a variety of different uh, particle shapes, here we have a solid sphere in red, a long rod in green, a flat disc in yellow, a hollow, a hollow sphere in blue, and a dumbbell looking particle in purple. And you can see that from their scattering curves, you can already determine that they're gonna have very different particle shapes. Uh, 
but then the pair distance distribution function is going to help you even more by giving you that quantitative edge by determining the uh, the particle size as well as the different uh, size as well as the size of the different features of that particle. And so this is going to be very very useful, especially for like catalysis. If you're looking at nanoparticle suspensions or you're looking at quantum dots, you could even use it to quantify those. Um, and these are just a variety of different transforms that you can do. Uh, moving, o moving on to another different kind of transform, which is the Polrod law. Um, again, it's just a different transformation. Here we have, as an example, I have this uh, protein ensemble. We have this scattering curve on the left. If I take that intensity and I multiply it by the scattering vector to the power of four, and then I plot that against the scattering vector itself, I'm going to get uh, a curve like this, which has a variety of different peaks, which I can then fit using Porod's law. And Porod's law is essentially an application of these different functions at the bottom. But essentially, all this is going to give you is the Porod invariant, or what's called Q. And that's essentially uh, going to provide a lot of significant surface information as well as surface to volume information, which you can then use to characterize your sample. Uh, again, this is gonna be very useful for things like uh, proteins or even catalysis where surface, um, surface studies are significantly more, um, more, more important. So uh, now that I've given you a variety of different transforms and uh, different ways to analyze your data, I just wanted to give you a few examples of how we might apply this in the real world. And so here in the wild, <laughs> I have uh, a study. Uh, so basically what this group was doing is they were studying the directed assembly of various optoelectronically active conjugated molecules. And so what they did is they had these C60 balls and then they would attach it with different ligands. And what's cool is that these different ligands would self-assemble or they would change the self-assembly uh, on different scales. So on the left here, we have this, uh, this buckyball with four different chains. And so what you can see is that it's self-assembling into a core particle and then the ligands are hanging off and then using SACS, they were able to determine the exact size of uh, the core and of those ligands and of the overall assembly, which is, which is great, very, very powerful. Um, by changing the ligand, they were actually able to achieve a hierarchical structure. So at higher temperatures, you would still get that, you would get that similar core with ligand, uh, with ligands attached structure. But then as you would reduce the temperature, this structure, this uh, core ligand structure would self-assemble even more into a lamellar structure, uh, which uh, looked which looked and resembled more of a fiber. And then by using SACS, they were able to observe the different signatures here. So we have one peak in I and then another peak for, for two I. And you can see that using SACS in situ, they were able to look at this uh, structure transformation um, on the meso scale, which is pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, another example that I have for you comes from our very own Leo group here at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So what her group was doing was looking, was trying to create cubosomes for uh, drug delivery using a microfluidic device that was actually fabricated here at the MRL. And so what they did was they uh, channeled in some lipid ethanol and water mixtures into their microfluidic device. And uh, after extracting a little bit of ethanol, they were able to, to get some cubosomes that were on the order of about 200 nanometers in less than 15 minutes. And if you're wondering what a cubosome is, don't worry, I didn't know either, but uh, basically they're cubic cells in lipid leaflets. And uh, that, that's really interesting because these are organic molecules that are organizing in like very, very regular uh, cubic structures. But back to the cubosomes and back to the study itself, uh, what they were able to do was that they were able to analyze the formation of these cubosomes as a function of time using both SACS and WAC and uh, cryo-TEM, excuse me. So in the SACS data here, you have a variety of different curves starting at the beginning. 
and then going all the way to 14 minutes, which is when they finally formed the cubosomes. And you can see that the peaks that they were getting for the 14 minute, um, the 14 minute flow resembled that of the bulk cubosomic structure. And they were able to determine this using SACS. And they were also able to confirm this doing, using cryo-TEM here at the MRL as well, using the Vitrobot. Um, and as a function of time, you can see those cubosome structures coming together, which is also pretty cool. Um, one final example that I have for you is uh, another study coming out of Penn State from the Jim Runt group. And so here, like I mentioned before, you can use that two-dimensional pattern to study orientation. And so here, they were doing an orientation study on ethylene tetrafluoroethylene. And uh, here we have two samples. On the left, we have the sax and wax pattern for an unoriented or unstretched sample. And then on the right, we have that same, th those uh, same two patterns, but for the stretched sample. And so you can see that as they stretched the sample that was orienting the sample more and more, causing that uh, scattering to become more anisotropic, which then they were able to, uh, to back calculate. And so um, I hope you can see that SACS is, is pretty powerful um, because it can give you a multitude of different characteristic information about your sample from just a single experiment, which is non-destructive and pretty quick. Um, from the sex pattern itself, you can transform it into the Dunier plot to get the radius of gyration, which is going to be indicative of your average particle size. You can transform it into a Kratky plot, which can give you information about your compactness and about your different folding states and also particle shape. And then you can also transform it yet again using the pair distance distribution function, which is going to give you quantifiable uh, shape and size information. And so all of this is really going to work together. All this information is going to be complementary. And um, this isn't limited to any one particular uh, phase of matter either. This can be used for on solids, liquids, and even gases if you're using a confined cell. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope you can see that SAX is a very powerful technique. Uh, the SAX system that we have here at the MRL, this is our Fontis system. And so here we have the, excuse me, we have our x-ray source going through our line. Uh, you would install your samples here and then ultimately going to the detector. And the SACS system here is capable of uh, SACS, ultra SACS, which is a smaller angle SACS experiment. Then we can also do GSACS, which is a grazing incidence experiment that is more surface sensitive. So if you want to look at things like polymer films or thin films, GSACS will be very, very helpful to that to that end. And then we can also do wax, wide angle x-ray scattering. So uh, I hope you appreciate the talk. I hope you appreciate the technique. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me uh, or any of my colleagues here at the MRL. Uh, you can reach out to me. Uh, I'm, I'm Juan. My email's on the, on the screen, but then you can also reach out to Muhammad Ali or Mauro Sardella if you have any other questions. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And that pretty much completes my talk. Right. Thank you very much, Juan, for this excellent introduction to SACS and WAX. Uh, we're already getting questions about uh, if you can make those beautiful, beautiful slides uh, available for, for people to, to get in PDF form. Uh, I, I'm suggesting here that the, the attendees att uh, contact you directly or email is in the screen there. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, one question we got here was actually for SACS, if you actually look at the biosamples, they need to be in a dried form or if you can actually you look them directly in liquids. You covered that, but can you pretty much uh, discuss that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can look at biological samples in a variety of different ways. Um, since drying out biological samples tends to affect their structure and their biological activity, um, generally most, uh, most users will keep their, their samples uh, contained in some form of solution, uh, which will maintain the integrity of their sample, but then you can also dry it out if you'd like to as well. There is no restrictions. Uh, it's just what you want to look at and whether or not your 
biological sample will remain active. Good, and also uh, one of the attendees, Mark Levenstein here also added that, uh, responded to the question that, yes, yeah, SACS can be used, look at biosamples in liquid suspension, which is indeed one of the most powerful things in the technique because it will look at the samples in non-destructively in their native state as well. Uh, another question came here is, uh, can you say a few words if you can compare, it, for example, Parod's law uh, with the with some XR X-ray reflectivity? Is there a comparison there to be made? Because um, you have a, a, a scattering vector of the power four, for example. Oh, I see. I see. So. Poron's law and X-ray reflectivity, to my understanding, they're not going to be as complementary. Uh, and the reason why is because um, X-ray reflectivity is going to be an internal reflection within the film, whereas Porod's law, it's essentially scattering off of the surface. Um, another thing is that in order to do X-ray reflectivity, you generally, for an optimal, optimal experiment, you need a very flat surface. In order to uh, increase the increase the, the signals that you'll be getting, uh, with Porod's law, that is not the case. You can have a very rough surface, a very smooth surface. Uh, you'll be able to apply Porod's law regardless. Okay. Uh, one question here about the X-ray source that we, in our system, does it uh, when you are in a general system when you show the general diagram of a SAX instrument, uh, does the X-ray source where where does the monochromator it's all on that particular configuration or in a configuration? Oh yeah, great question. So the monochromator is usually within the X-ray source uh, box within that ensemble. And uh, it's usually just a, a, a construction of a, a variety of different mirrors uh, that will mirror those X-ray beams, uh, monochromatizing the beam as it goes out of the source. Okay, yeah. So the other one is about generally, uh, Actually, I, I was thinking about that to ask you that question as well, but Jack already went ahead of me. Uh, can you say a few words about what is required for sample preparation? Of course, that depends on the sample. How long a typical experiment will take in our lab and so on? Great question. So um, I didn't go over sample prep today, but uh, that's because sample prep is extremely easy. Uh, if you're looking at powders, for example, you can just take your powder and put it in a, in a capsule and then pop it right onto the SACS system. Uh, if you uh, want to look at, say, say different suspensions, we generally recommend uh, in the milligrams of material per milliliter. And uh, you, you don't need a lot either. Uh, generally, you can look at a few milliliters without an issue. Uh, so if you don't have a ton of sample to work with, that usually won't be a problem. And it's also non-destructive. So you won't have to worry about losing that sample in order to study it. And then, uh, sorry, what was the second question? I think that was, I mean, how long does it experiment take? Right, right. So uh, the experiment, that will depend on how many samples you have, but also the, the type of, uh, the quality of the data that you want. You can generally run a sample within 20, 30 minutes if you're just doing a single sample, but if you're doing more complicated uh, complicated studies and you want better quality data, you can actually do some, some SACS runs that will be on the order of five to 10 hours. So it, it's going to be dependent on what you want to try and extract out of your data, but it, it tends to be pretty quick, but if you want better data, you're gonna have to scan for a bit longer. Okay. Uh, one question here is about the, the scattering vector equation, which is 4 pi sine theta over lambda. I think you showed that equation somewhere. He's asking for you to explain that or comment on that equation. I think that's a general equation that we see in many books relating the angle to theta with the, yeah, yeah that one. So I did, I, I'm going to cover a little bit of that equation in my presentation in a few weeks. Uh, it, it can, you can derive that equation directly when you write the scattering vectors relationship in the, in the reciprocal space. And then when they are actually both assuming that you have a last scattering, so the modules of the two vectors are equal, then you can come straight to that equation. So uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you comment more, 
But I'm going to talk about that in my X-ray talk in three weeks or so. But go ahead, uh, Juan. Juan, anything more to add? Oh, my apologies. I muted myself. Um, so that's a great question, yeah. Um, especially if you're coming from a diffraction background. So the scattering vector can look a lot like, uh, like Bragg spacing, for example. But um, I think the, the easiest way to try and understand it and the way it's generally derived is if you have uh, like a wavelength coming in and it's scattering off, it's going to scatter off at different angles. But then that scattering vector is going to be its original, uh, it's essentially just going to be a geometric relation between that scattering vector and then the incoming incoming wavelength uh, using this relation. Yeah, so if you keep on this screen there, Q is actually QF minus QI. So if K, K, sorry, K, KF minus KY. Yeah. So if you do like the vectorial subtraction there, uh, as, as long as you assume that the both Ks are equal, uh, then you can come down to that equation down there. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, another question that came here was, uh, can you get shape and size distribution from the scattering data? I mean, we talk about that, right, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, so generally, it, it depends on the sort of information that you want, but if you want quantifiable uh, size and shape data, uh, the paired distance distribution function is gonna be hard to beat. Um, in order to do the, in order to transform your data, you're just gonna to have to use this equation below and then we can talk about it more. Feel free to reach out to me if you need a little help with that. If, I think the one last question we have is about the isotropy of the samples. So, and I think you covered that a little bit. How, how does the anisotropy, anisotropy, anisotropy of the sample actually will affect the result in SACS? That's a great question, yeah. So the, so the less symmetric your sample is, so say it isn't like a perfect sphere, it's going to give you oriented patterns, oriented two-dimensional scattering patterns, uh, like I have here on this slide. And it's essentially that anisotropy is going to change in a degree relation to the orientation of your sample. And so uh, more random orientations are going to be isotropic, whereas more oriented samples are going to have like more diffraction like scattering over here on the right. Correct. And that's a point where actually SOCKS can be a technique that where it's very easy to acquire the data. And then when you wanna process and extract full information from the data, you need to process, process it very carefully and sometimes with like modeling that may take some time, right? Yeah. So it depends yeah. on how, how, how much deep you want to go into that. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that was the last question we had here. Uh, any more comments from you, uh, Juan? Um, no, I just wanted to thank everybody. And uh, if you have any more questions or uh, you didn't get a chance to to type, type out your question, please feel free to send me an email and I'd be happy to help. Uh, one last question that just popped up here before we said oh, goodbye yeah, yeah. was, uh, can you tell the correlation of the fiber orientation and the pattern? Basically, by look at the lax pattern, the, 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 the sax pattern from the fiber, can you, we can identify, right? You show that the, the, the orientation of the fiber from that data. That's what I think sax is famous for. Yes, yes. I'll let you comment more. Yes, absolutely. So as you orient that sample, uh, again, you're just orienting all, orienting, orienting all those scattering centers, uh, causing that pattern to become more anisotropic. And so here I have an example where it's, it's, it's the same polymer, the same fiber, but uh, on the left it's being, on the left it's unstretched. And so you have that isotropic scattering pattern in both the wax and sax, and then it becomes uh, anisotropic as you stretch it over here on the right. And you can observe that in both the sax and the wax. And then you can correlate that back in order to calculate the degree of orientation of your sample. So in one last one here coming, uh, that in terms of intensity, uh, most of the time we see like intensity as arbitrary units. Does it mean that in general, the shape of the intensity is what matters and not exactly the numerical values? Uh, so, 
if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, they're saying what matters more is the shape of the pattern rather than the intensity. Sometimes they see the literature, they intend to be plotted as arbitrary units. Uh, and then basically, what does it mean? It means that we should not worry about too much the numbers and just about the sh general shape of the curve so, rather than numerical values. Right, so both are going to be important, but it's gonna depend on what you want to, want to extract out of your sample. So if you have like a very well-behaved particle suspension and you just wanna analyze particle shape, then intensity won't be as important. Um, but then if you're trying to do a more complicated protein folding study, for example, then you need all the intensity that you can get in order to resolve all of the different inter-protein distances as an example. Yeah. So it's going to depend on your use case. So I may add that one. I think in some cases also, I think you mentioned there, but in some cases there is a need for like absolute intensity. There are actually standard samples, reference samples that we use to extract exactly the, the, the intensity we're getting through. Uh, and also the, the, deal, the deal with intensity sometimes is very relative because in many of the experiments, once you collect the intensity, you do need to subtract that intensity from the dispersion, from the solution, and from the container, like the capillary. Oh, so yeah. yeah. Actually, you get like a final scattering intensity there. Yeah. So it's a bit more involved, that question, then uh, we will be happy to discuss. With uh, David, he had that questions. But I think in general, I mean, we should just look at the general shape and so on, but in case where absolute intensity is needed, there are procedures to calibrate that and even the standards to do that. Right, okay. absolutely. All right, so we better run away now before these people start asking more questions here. <laughs> and no one. Anyway, uh, well, no, uh, just kidding. Uh, you're getting a lot of thank you for many of the attendees here for the excellent seminar. Uh, anything else to add, Juan? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank everybody for the time and uh, yeah, I just wish all of you a great day. Stay safe. Right. Thanks again, Juan. I mean, Juan will be happy to share the slides in PDF if you connect, contact to him. Within a few days, we'll be posting this in our, uh, the, the webinar in our YouTube channel. Uh, don't forget next week again, Thursday, no time, uh, Rick, Dr. Rick Hash, which is our guru in XPS, is going to be showing a lot of XPS again. Uh, uh, it's a very applied seminar that is actually utilizing the technique in lithium ion battery materials. Uh, so I hope to see you all uh, next week. In the meantime, let us know if you have any questions about the webinars, about access to the facilities. I hope everyone is, is staying safe. See you guys again uh, um, next week and have a great rest of your week here. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye everyone.